We are pleased to continue to host uh, these workshops or working groups that we will be uh, making a video recording of for uh, for viewing later on. And those videos are posted to our safety policy divisions web page. And with that, uh, I just would like to turn it over to um, Joe of uh, Sempra San Diego Gas and SoCal Gas to continue with the day's affairs. All right, thanks, Fred. Appreciate it. I I do want to check. Is the uh, okay? Yeah, I think the little red button there means it's being recorded. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Fred. I do appreciate the intro. Uh, many of us have been on these workshops over the last couple of weeks. I used to write my narrative, and now I just go off off my cuff. This is the fourth of five scheduled workshops uh, today. The agenda is going to focus on the EII, Electric Infrastructure Integrity Risk Chapter, and the, which is SDG &E, has to do with our electric assets, distribution assets, and then SDG &E, SoCal Gas Cybersecurity Risk. Uh, that is a, a cybersecurity is a risk that is, if you will, well shared uh, between both SoCal Gas and SDG &E. Um, So those are the two risks that we'll be going over today. The idea is spend the first hour on EII and the second hour on cyber. I sent a, uh, again, based on feedback from the different parties after uh, one of the workshops we had in August, we asked folks, all right, suggestions, requests for future workshops. Uh, and then we identified the five. Today's is, I think, I think it was turn based upon their request, they identified both EII and cyber as risks they'd like to have a discussion on, uh, if you will. Uh, paraphrasing, uh, hopefully correctly, uh, request the workshop to discuss EII and cyber, overview the work papers to discuss, excuse me, overview the work papers to discuss how the RRC values are calculated, uh, including data points and data sources. Uh, they don't object to a presentation, uh, but they do prefer uh, to the extent possible, uh, provide most of the time for a, a Q&A session, if you will. And uh, yeah, I think that's the last two. And so just FYI, uh, with regards to e EII, uh, we will be, uh, we do have, I think, two intro slides that we're gonna be going over, maybe just one. Wanted to provide some upfront clarity, if you will, on differences of the types of mitigations that are in EII relative to what would be possibly in the wildfire risk chapter. Uh, and then also with regards to cyber, you'll see on the slide here, uh, when I sent out the FYI of the future workshops, I included this note, uh, discussions on cybersecurity risk will be limited to overviewing the non-confidential data in the supplemental work papers that we had uh, provided everyone uh, on July 27th and to answering uh, specific questions submitted uh, prior to the workshop uh, to the extent answers can then be provided to those questions uh, using public and non-restricted information data. I'll go over a little bit more of what that means when we have, if you will, the intro to the cybersecurity presentation. But what you will have noticed, if you looked at the uh, presentation I provided earlier this morning, it is a rather, I think it's like 60 pages of a presentation. And again, I'll, we'll get into this a bit more before we start the cyber discussion. Uh, the idea is we wanted to, we put together the presentation and we know folks had asked not for extensive presentations. Cyber is a little bit different. And as much as 90, 95%, if you will, of the data in the work papers is classified as confidential. And not everyone on this call has uh, submitted a signed NDA. So we are very cautious with regards to, if you will, the free flow of Q&A during uh, this afternoon's cyber discussion. Uh, we, are, we, we did not want to put any of our presenters in the situation where they may need to answer a question in real time and then accidentally divulge data that is classified as confidential. So we did take the approach of preparing a presentation of cyber uh, rather than a pure open Q&A. 
Uh, so again, just wanted to mention that upfront. We'll go into a little bit more of that uh, in detail when we actually start the, the cyber discussion. That's it for my intro. Uh, any questions from folks before we get started? This is uh, Marty Kurtovich, and uh, I had a question because we have been having an internal debate in the commission about what energy or electric integrity infrastructure risk really is, because we don't really understand the definition that you provided, and it's unclear whether it's only regarding equipment that has already failed past tense or if it includes intact uh, equipment or it excludes intact equipment. So we'd really appreciate if you can define the scope. All right, we'll certainly attempt to do that. Uh, just a second. All right, uh, and hopefully I know Christian was planning on dialing in. Hopefully he has a chance to have dialed in. If not, um, we'll certainly answer that question during this call, Martin. Any other questions before we get going? If not, then I'm gonna try to load up an other PowerPoint. Can I slide this? I don't know how to load up now. Do I have to, if I wanna load a different one, do I have to stop sharing and then load up the different one? Let's try that. Stop sharing. Close this one. Close this one. Sorry about this. And now we're going to share again. Share. Share. This over. Share. Let's bring. This one over. Just a second. There we go. All right. I think you're seeing the intro slides that we prepared for EII. And um, I just I do want to check. As I said, I'm not able to see Christian's on, but he's on his phone. Okay. I think he might be able to help out. Uh, this was the intro slide that we put together. As I said, we did want to provide some clarity, and, and Martin, this may help, uh, on the distinction between what may be in the EII risk chapter relative to in the wildfire, since they both involve our electrical uh, distribution and equipment. And so um, I'm going to read it. Again, I think Christian might be on his phone driving, so um, minimize discussion of all of that. But we wanted to give the definition EII, uh, electric infrastructure integrity, the risk of an asset failure caused by degradation, age, operation outside of design criteria due to unexpected events or field conditions, uh, for example, force of nature, on an asset no longer complying with the latest, on an, as, on an asset no longer complying with the latest engineering standards, which results in a safety or reliability incident. And so in scope, uh, the risk of an electric asset failure due to internal or external factors, which results in serious injury, fatalities, or reliability impacts. Out of scope, electric asset failures resulting in a wildfire or the analysis around the impact of a wildfire. Uh, overhead asset failure within the high fire threat district. Uh, so I think, Martin, to your question of does it pertain to assets pre and or post failure. I think that's sort of the, right. I think that was your, yeah, your question. Christian, are you able to provide an answer to that? Can, can you guys hear me? Can do. There we go. Sorry, I was having some fun technical difficulties. Uh, so I, can you repeat the question one more time to make sure I understand it correctly? I, I believe I heard the tail end, but if you would repeat it one more time, I'd be much obliged. Yeah, if, if Martin, hopefully I, I characterize it correctly. Uh, the question is, does the EII risk chapter pertain to assets only after they have failed, or does it pertain to assets pre, you know, both before they have failed and after they have failed? 
Yeah, another way to say it is operational equipment or non-operational equipment. And also, if you could add why uh, you excluded contact by energized equipment um, in this risk. Okay. Yeah, so th the first part, our EII chapter includes all in infrastructure that's in this as energized. So we did not include assets, if I heard you correctly, that were um, not energized or assets that are deemed already removed. So it's really assets that are in the system today is a part of our analysis. So we took a body of how many assets we have in a system that are being used and useful. And that was our approach as far as uh, infrastructure integrity scope of work. As you can see on the slide deck, you know, it doesn't include asset failure that starts a wildfire or analysis and that impact really more on the reliability from a customer standpoint. Um, I think your second question as well uh, on the, the energized equipment from uh, customer contact. We had a, another chapter that speaks to that. Our view was more of uh, from the stance of failure. You know, when these assets fail, what occurred? One of the bigger uh, line items that really had the risk adjustment for this one, well, I mean, I won't call it risk adjustments, but increase was because we had a failure of our assets that resulted in a, a, a contact. So that's where this chapter is really more our assets are intact operating, but it's the failure portion is what we reviewed. And that was analysis based off is that failure portion, the failure rates associated with our equipment. Hope that addressed your question. Uh, well, that leads to the next question is then why does this in scope say serious injuries and fatalities? Yeah, that's a really good question. So in some situations when we do have a wire down, when the asset has failed, it can result in the wire still being energized from a back feed and the like, and that's where those serious injuries fatalities come into play. When an individual does come in contact with the asset that has failed, that has introduced an unsafe situation where a public may come in contact with that asset and result in a serious injury fatality. Okay, um, it, I'm not sure this clears it up, but thank you for that explanation. Yep, Martin, maybe to help out uh, the additional question you had with regards to, I think, um, contact with equipment that is, if you will, operating in a normal configuration. In the previous ramp reports, we had a risk that was, I think the title was uh, public safety. Um, it was a public uh, consumer and public safety. So uh, risk chapter. We did not have that chapter this year. Um, and so we incorporated parts of that chapter uh, because part of that chapter would have included on the, if you will, on the gas side, what we refer to as behind the meter uh, incidents, incidents involving behind the meter assets. We incorporated those within our gas medium pressure in, uh, risk chapter. There was also aspects of that, again, customer and public safety risk chapter that involved public um, contact. I'm sorry, Joey, you're confusing me even more because I'm an old utility veteran myself and I'm only talking about your electric assets. All right. Um, the thing, the issue is uh, you say it's only for operational equipment, but then you say it also considers injuries and fatalities after the equipment has failed. So you are including both operational and non-operational equipment that's still energized. I see, I'm trying to get it from a utility engineer's perspective. How do I define it? How do you talk about it to your utility engineers, this risk? Okay, I think I think I see what you're, you're getting at, Martin. So for, for our approach, and I'll, I'll rephrase it differently, it's really tied to those areas and assets that have failed. You know, my, when, I, when you answered the, the original question, I was thinking more of it's not useful. We have no need for it in those assets. But I think what you're getting at is is the, at the consequence, and that's the consequence portion. So yes, yeah, so on the consequence portion, we are looking at asset failure is really tied to this infrastructure integrity portion. I, ho I hope that is able to help a little bit. Sorry if I misspoke earlier. Okay, because um, quite frankly, the way the ramp is written, it has led to the commission. Um, believing that contact with energized equipment is for operational equipment, and this uh, risk is only related to failed equipment. That's correct. This one's related to failed Okay, thank you. If I could jump in, this is Fred Haynes from uh, SPD. I would interpret this to mean that most of the time, if a piece of equipment fails, 
a member of the public is not likely to be harmed, but in a few instances, it could lead to them being harmed, like the example you gave of a wire fails in service, it's still energized, it comes down, and it's able to contact somebody that way. So the person had a safety consequence because they came in contact with something that had failed. The other risk is there's no failure, the equipment is operating normally, it's just doing its thing, but a member of the public comes into contact with a live functional working piece of equipment, it's, it's not an equipment failure that caused that, that contact. So I hope, Marty, maybe I can explain that to you some more offline, but it's fairly clear in my mind that what the difference is. Would you agree with that, Joe and company? Yeah, I would agree with that uh, interpretation of it. It's the asset failure causing the concern rather than the asset operating as designed and desired to. So I, I was correct. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Uh, this is Chris Parks with Caliber Kids. Um, so I had a couple questions. If since it's the topic that's in front of us, um, does does Consempra talk about or SDG and Ian's um, talk about um, the purpose? What's behind this um, in scope and out of scope? What's the purpose of this definition? That's a great question. So our view and just kind of just, I like to say, playing the groundwork. A lot of times we've had certain, I don't call it data requests, but some confusion on electric infrastructure as it pertains to wildfire. You know, is it the same aspect? And we have a separate chapter to that. So just kind of send the ground rooms as far as saying, hey, this is not a wildfire analysis. This is more reliability and safety aspect. Wildfires is a separate chapter. And I think you guys kind of might have talked to them already. So that's where this was discussion is really tailored to the reliability and the safety portion of it not tied to wildfire. Hence why we kind of just want to set to some ground levels in that space. Hope that maybe answer some questions if there was some confusion in that area. So if I if I understand it right, you're trying to um, partition out wildfire from other electric infrastructure risk. Is that do I have that right or am I not understanding correctly? For this chapter, for this ramp chapter, that is correct. We didn't do any analysis for this ramp chapter, electric infrastructure integrity, from a consequence of wildfire. We have a ramp chapter that's wildfire, which they did that analysis as far as asset failure and ignition associated with those. So that was a separate chapter in our ramp filing. And then on above it says on this slide, foreign asset no longer complying with the latest engineering standards which results in a safety or reliability incident. Um, so latest engineering standards, are are those changing all the time? Um, is that is that something that is going to, I mean, over time, you're, you're distinguishing between equipment that's not being installed today or that was installed years ago that would not likely um, meet, you know, the latest current engineering standards if i understand you correctly correct it's it's not a um, a weekly item but it is either a, a general order requirement or the manufacturers say we're out of business those kind of things kind of drive certain decisions we have internally of hey we need to update our standards accordingly or an incident that occurred that made us revisit how we construct our equipment uh, those are some of the drivers that kind of help us push in that avenue of hey we need to make some changes to this and review this uh, because of certain conditions. It doesn't happen often, but it's something that is sometimes a driver for us to uh, come up with a program to mitigate a concern in our system. Okay, and why are you specifically calling that out um, in this risk of an asset failure? Um, uh, you know, you, you mentioned earlier on in, the, in that paragraph, you know, caused by degradation, age, operation, outside, um, is there a specific reason that you're now using adding this thing or an asset that no longer complies with latest engineering standards to delineate it from, you know, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm just trying to understand why that ad addition is part of this definition. Uh, good, great, great question. It, just, it ties to our explanation as far as how we deem this, uh, the definition of this description. So, you know, like I mentioned before, there's other aspects that could lead to us to creating mitigation in our infrastructure. 
and that was one that could come up as the latest engineering standards. What we try to do is capture a, a decent amount and then internally have those conversations. So if we have a mitigation or a program, hey, does it fall in this definition? If the answer is yes, then we know we can do certain decisions we make internally. So it's more of a description that allows us to make some further decisions internally. Um, but like I said, it's a driver and we use other factors, including to that, to help us make that decision going forward. Thanks for that answer, uh, responding to those questions. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I quite understand it, but, uh, but thank you. I'll leave it to others. Thanks. Hi, this is Tom from Turn. <clears throat> Excuse me. A um, couple of questions. I would appreciate a little bit of um, an explanation of what is considered a failure. And if that also helps to explain something we'll see in the work papers, which is what's an incident, that would be helpful. Hey, Tommy, yeah, great, great question. So a failure for us is an asset that results in an outage to a customer. Um, so a good example is our underground cable, where in those situations we have a cable over time where they fail. And a failure is when there's a high amount of fault current from a ground standpoint or a failure internally, which results in protection operating to isolate that damaged location. Uh, another failure it, it is associated with our overhead, where we have our connectors connected with over time or the degradation or from a corrosion, they can, um, <clears throat> excuse me, break and results in the wire coming down. You know, those are the types of failures that we identified in this location. And it really stems to the reliability standpoint from a customer impact where uh, the loss of power and, and an outage. So those are the incidents and those events that we've identified as a failure in our system. Just to name a couple examples, I hope that helps. Uh, that, yes, it does. Thanks. Um, was there a, did, did someone want to follow up? Yeah, Tom, you mentioned the difference between failure and incident. And if I heard Christian correctly, are you saying that the words are used interchangeably? That's a question for for Christian, right? Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, Tom, I just wanted to get clear. I wanted to make sure that you got your your question answered. Correct. I'd say to say a failure incident could be used interchangeably. Okay, that's helpful. Um, so, um, just to make sure I understood that, if there's not an outage, I mean, something could go wrong, but if it doesn't cause an outage, um, then it's not a failure <clears throat> or an incident. Is that right? For this analysis, we took a consequence and likelihood. So in this inc incident for this discussion and to develop our risk score, that's correct. Okay, all right. So the events that are being considered here are only ones that cause outage. Um, I mean, I'm not an engineer, but something could go wrong, but there could be a backup that kicks in and that prevents the outage from happening. And so in that, in that situation, then there would not be a, um, this would not be considered an incident or a, an event that is, um, considered it, it's not one of the things that you're considering an event for this risk. Is that right? I would say it depends on that backup. We have in our system a lot of tie switches, what helps us to manage load from one to the other. But then outage did occur, how does operate that tie switch to transfer load? We would still categorize that as an incident. So it's those incidents where it's um, where there wasn't a an outage to a customer that we identified that we did not identify in our analysis to determine the risk. Okay, and would it would it include a momentary outage? Yes, yeah, uh, yes, okay. momentary outage was included in our study. Okay, all right, and then um, I think I understand this, but I want to be clear about the the distinction between <clears throat> the wild what's covered by the wildfire risk and what's covered here. Um, anything HFT? This this nothing in th this chapter this part of your analysis doesn't cover anything to, in the high fire threat district at all right nothing it, the, it's the, not, underground, it's not the, underground, the underground so i think it's it's key to keep that consequence portion so our underground is included in our hftd because of the outage portion of it but the the, the risk as far as ignition was is not included okay so this risk includes underground Asset failures in HFTD. Correct. Hang on just a second. Um, 
but no overhead asset failures in HFTD. And then if there is a if there's a failure of an asset in the non-HFTD portion of um, the system, it it's included in this risk chapter up to the point that it causes an ignition. No, I'm so sorry. Maybe I, no. So we did not include any ignition uh, analysis in this risk chapter. It was on reliability from a customer outage or safety, serious injury, fatality uh, data point. So that's that's what we use. We didn't capture any ignition studies within this chapter. Yeah, I think we're saying the same thing. And maybe okay. probably my question wasn't very clear. Um, so you're saying if if the failure in a, a in a, the non HFTD part of the system um, once the failure um, becomes an ignition then it's no longer counted as part of this risk. Is oh, that right? Great question, great question. No, it's it still is. So it's, when we did our review, because that failure still caused, caused an outage, we didn't include the consequence of an ignition in our analysis. We just took the consequence of a reliability incident, aka a customer out of power, safety impacts. That's our, our analysis. So those were the drivers. Ignition could occur, but we didn't take that as a factor until our review of this uh, RAMP chapter. Okay, um, I want to get that down for a second, so bear with me. Um, no, take your time, take your time, please. As, as a key point to identify in the two separate uh, chapters. So, so if if a um, non-HFTD failure um, includes both an outage and, and an ignition, it's going to be counted here as part of the, in the wild, I'm sorry, in the EII risk. And it's also going to be counted in the wildfire risk. I, I can't speak on behalf of the wildfire risk. I, I yeah, I, I would have to play fault with them on that standpoint as far as the ignition portion, if that's included in their data set. But I do know for this chapter, we didn't include any aspects as far as wildfire goes, and excuse me, ignitions in our analysis of, of the risk for asset failure. Um, so, I, and I know this isn't your area, but I, while, while I was thinking about these questions, I did go to the wildfire work paper to see how the pre-mitigation risk scores were calculated for wildfire. And there is an, a, a non-HFTD component to it. Um, so, um, and then the non-HFTD component includes a, an assumed value of 9.20 incidents per year. Um, so it sounds like that could overlap with some of the incidents that are being counted in this risk. Yeah, I'd have to check with the team on that one because I'm not involved with the ramp, the uh, wildfire chapter in that space. But I have to check. We we'll have to take that back and follow with you a follow up on that request. Um, all right. Um, yeah. So let me just you know because this seems to be a sort of a cross cutting issue. It involves two risks. You know the question is whether there's some overlap and double counting happening in terms of the the lower value, whether certain incidents are being counted twice. So put that as a request to to SDG and E to help us sort that out. Okay, Judge yeah. you got that? Yeah, yet? I want I wanted to make sure I was unmuted. Yes. Um uh, and if it's readily in front of you, Tom, great. If not, when you see the 9.2 value you referenced, do you have a, are you able to say specifically where that is? Or, I mean, if not, we can, we can find okay. it. Yeah, yeah, sure. I have it. Um, good, good question. It's on the final 2021 work paper, SDG &E wildfire level two. Yep. It doesn't have RSE in the, in the name. Yep. And it's, yep. it's, it's the risk scoring work paper tab. Thank you. Sure. Yes, uh, we will follow up. Noted. Okay. Good. 
Um, I think those are my questions for now on this on this slide. And then just as a reminder, we will, um, Christian wanted to give some overview, uh, answer questions on an overview standpoint. And then after that discussion, we'll, we'll load up the, the EII uh, slot, um, work papers. So just FYI on that. So Joe, this is Marty. Is, are you going to go over the uh, bow tie? We, don't, we did not have a slide on the bow tie. So go ahead. We were, go ahead with your questions. Oh, I was just curious if you're going to go over the risk drivers and consequences, but that's okay. Yeah, uh, whatever the agenda is fine. Great. We, that was not, we were not going to, but again, if you have any specific questions. No, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Joe, Kristen, you want, yes. Is that Fred? No, it's me. It's Christian. Can, can you oh. share that Excel? I'm having some struggle right now with uh, Excel opening up on my side. Yeah. Okay. Can do. All right. I'm going to unshare and then load up the spreadsheet. Okay. That's how I do things. Okay. All right. All right. Um, while I'm loading this, Kristen, did you want to go over? Uh, we did receive a, another question from a stakeholder. Kristen, did you want to go over that while I was loading this or? Yeah, I can speak to that. Uh, so, it's important to note too for the electric infrastructure integrity chapter. You know, with the events that we have in our system and in outages, um, there's a good chance that every, from a year to year standpoint, there's a lot of volatility from you know emergency events, uh, weather events, uh, a cluster of equipment failures, uh, length of duration, fire season, all, all those kind of factors play into you know the the, the values from a year to year changing. Um, so a lot of times for us from a cost standpoint as well, and from a, a going forward, we usually try to do the best we can to keep it where we're at from a reliability standpoint and maintain reliability in our system. Um, I think this is the 15th year we've been the best in the West and our plans continue that effort, which requires you know, not, not only just reviewing, but also new programs and new initiatives, new aspects in that area to help us continue that process moving forward. So for us, we're, we're, we're really, uh, Going to honed in on that portion. Uh, one thing too, I wanted to mention as well in that space as it pertains to trends in our system and what that looks like. You know, for us, an outage where equipment failed could be a, a customer outage for one customer for two hours, or it could be you know an asset based on location, uh, you know, two hours for a thousand customers. You know, all those factors per year plays a part into this aspect, especially even the conversation earlier. Overhead versus underground also has a different uh, component. So. A lot of drivers to volatility of our liability system, which is a challenge to identify certain trends in that area, but we do foresee that we, you know, our goal is always to maintain and do the best we can on a year to year basis. What Joe is showing here, and I said, sorry for the technical difficulties I'm running into, is just a little more description as far as a work paper that we provided. Uh, and it kind of just goes in details for those aspects. And Joe, can you scroll down for me on the screen, Joe? So it highlights some of the, the sources, the locations, the units, what we populate, and those areas internally to help us derive some of these values. Uh, the, the big one that you can see here is the reliability, uh, internal reliability data, which is uh, one of the big stakeholders for us in the understanding. And that's that's a lot of the information that we have today is based on the reliability data. So that's why the question on ignitions and that perspective, you know, we didn't bring that data in to our analysis and our calculations. We utilize our reliability data for the calculation standpoint. Uh, so high level, I'll, I'll pause there if there's any questions, but this is kind of a, a good work paper that shows that our sources and kind of how we get some information from. This is Marty Kurtovich. Could you describe uh, how you came up with this um, approach? And did you use any, say, like other industry examples for um, developing this model and the weights and all that stuff? Because I don't think the commission has seen a MABF like this before. So, so Marty, I'm sorry, just for clarity, when you mention the weighting, so you are referring to um, on, within the MAVF, the, these range values here? Uh, more specific to the EII chapter, what you were showing, um, be, 
Does one of the confusions how you come up with the risk numbers, particularly the lores and the cores, and it looks like you have these indexes and part of the confusion is just when you start going into indexes, they have their own algorithms and we don't know what those algorithms are. So, and I, I'm just speaking from a um, former DOE person who used to work on energy codes a lot with, uh, you know, national organizations. Index has a specific meaning in utility law. So, um, sometimes utilities throw words around. So, but in this case, we are not really, it would be very helpful if you go through, you know, how you came up with the numbers, how you decide design the calculations to come up with the risk scores and particularly the lores and the cores. So I hope that was part of the agenda. Okay. And so since we are here and we have this one loaded up and the first one is the lore value for the EII risk. I think if we go over Christine, are you on the call to I think you're more familiar with some of these uh where and how we would have come up with some of these values? Yes, I'm happy to answer it. And uh, basically, when we look at the law uh, for the EI risks, we look at our internal database and to find out the historical average um, outage number. And uh, uh, we char characterize <laughs> like three different um, one is distribution, the other one sub substation, and the manhole. And for each one, they have uh, their own like the safety, reliability, and uh, stakeholder and financial um, attributes data consequence. So I'm not sure um, what's the particular question you're interested in, and uh, I'm happy to answer. So for example, in mm -hmm. lines 47 through 48, lore, it has assumed values. Uh, how does that play into the lore score? I don't. This oh. is an algorithm I can't figure out. So, uh, if you look at the, the total EI law, it will be the sum of these threes. So, the, the internal database provided the five year average data about 1623 uh, outages. And then uh, we have uh, another uh, uh, seven substation outages plus the manhole incidents. Um, uh, Related to the manhole and handhole and plate, those events we summarize and uh, to the total like 1632. So if you see up on row 32, mm -hmm. row 32 is the sum of these three values. Yes. Of lines 46 through 48? Yes. It's six. Right. Okay. Um, did you vet this with any outside parties before you incorporated it, or how did you vet this algorithm? Uh, when you say vet, are you saying with regards to the the method we use to calculate lore? Did we? Yeah. Did you talk to any other big utilities? You talked to Florida Power and Light. Did you talk to Detroit Edison? Is this something that you came up with internally and never consulted outside? Um, I, I think, again, uh, Christine, I think you. And I that's think okay, Joe. That's, that's yeah. okay. I, I was just curious. We, we can review. It's a, I think, yeah, we'll follow up on that, Martin. That's, thank you. So, similar for like safety, they are all summations of the, these uh, rows. Yes, so that's information is a summation. Yes, everything is weighted. Yes, everything is weighted. Um, like weighted average based on the incident. So, um, I have to say we use the our internal data instead of the industry data. Okay, I'm a little lost though. How can a reliability core be zero when you're telling me it's all about reliability? It should be a hundred. Uh, Which I don't value? Know you zero and how you get a, such a low financial score. But so if you could explain that, that'd be very helpful. 
which Martin, which values are you referring to? Your reliability um, up on 32, uh, your total scores, you show the reliability overall core consequence score for reliability is zero, which I'm reading as telling me there's no problem with reliability consequence. So even if you fixed it, you're not reducing the risk because it's already at the bottom. Uh, uh, that is decimal, sorry about that. So the total, if we talk about the reliability consequence, it could be 1,632 multiplied by this uh, D, D34, you will get the number of the consequence, of the reliability consequence. So it's not a zero, only the manhole is zero. The incident related to the manhole plate. I think if you just change the number of digits displayed in the yeah. cell, mm -hmm. we'll see more clearly what the value is. There you go. So there is a number there. Yes. Yeah, the problem <laughs> is that when you look at the total score, the percentage of the total score is less than 1%. Yeah. So it would be if I were betting on four mm -hmm. teams and uh, one team isn't winning, but it won one game. So that still counts. It's just the... I don't see, you know, reliability and safety are the two lowest scores in consequence. Uh, and I'm not sure that meets the standard for uh, what RAMP is really looking for, the major risks. But please continue your presentation. I don't mean to hold you up. Mark, let me just paraphrase your questions. You're looking since overall, these overall values are in essence the sum of these, I, I believe the values up above distribution, substation, manhole. And you're saying, well, the consequence that you are modeling from a reliability standpoint are, are all very small. And shouldn't the, the consequences that you are evaluating be larger than what you are modeling? No, what I'm saying is my job is to advise a commissioner and a judge on your ramp report. And when they look at the overall scores, which is what they're the only thing they're going to look at, they're going to ask me, how is reliability so low and the overall core score when, uh, and safety is even lower. And they're saying this is a ramp risk, the second highest risk in their system. Um, can you do me a favor, uh, Joe? Can you type the formula here? For example, if you look at the E10 equal, can you type equal? Where would you like me to go? Uh, any any blank cell next to the distribution. Yeah. So equal uh, D8. D8 times the reliability is D10 times D10, yes. D10, yes. Times, sorry, I haven't finished. <laughs> times 0.23, which is the weight, yes. Times 100, uh, let me see, uh, 100,000, the readability, yeah. And it's divided by 6,973. Yes, done. Can you click, uh, what's the percentage? It's about 88%, the reliability. Okay, thank you. I'll just say that's not intuitive in your ramp report. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Martin. We'll definitely follow up, follow up on that. I would say, Joe, something I'm observing about this particular risk chapter is that 
because the consequence score, the core is a pretty small number. Or the, that number is small because your sub attributes, safety, reliability, et cetera, are small numbers. You have a low number for a consequence score, but you have a high number for the number of times something will be out, some, an event will occur, the events that you're measuring in this risk, 1,632 a year, uh, multiplied by that low consequence produces a very high risk score, 9,000 something. So in my mind, what we I'd really like to know is how has that number of incidences, uh, the incident number, been trending over the years? Is that something that is more or less stable? Is it something that you've consistently been working on to reduce? Um, is it just a function of the overall? I mean, so to me, I think I think I see that the main driver of this risk is the number of times it occurs. If you do it enough times, then that low consequence is going to happen at some point. And then you will have a reliability or a safety uh, consequence. Um, so yeah, that's why I'm interested in in the uh, the behavior of the the number of events. Yeah, I'll, I'll okay. take a shot at Joe. Um, was that Fred? I believe asked that question. Yes, hi. Yeah, Fred here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's a great question, Fred. So I think for us at scg &E, there there's a, there a lot of volatility in our our outages and in those events, the 1632 that you see there, um, and a lot of factors play into that. You know, we, we we do the best we can. We continue trying to always improve in that matter and get those numbers down um, as much as we can. But it, it is a, a volatile number given on you know like I said other a lot of drivers. Weather is one. You know, cluster of certain equipment. The duration of fire season uh, in our fire season we we also extend certain uh, outages before we uh, reclose devices to make sure it's been patrolled longer and so outages can be extended um you know other factors include like i mentioned before and the stats so, of hey we may have one or two events you know one event for one location could be one customer for other it could be a thousand so on, on a year per year basis it's it is a trend that we're trying always to improve on and keep reducing um and another big aspect too to that as well is our top drivers in the reliability space on the distribution system, you know, two out of five top drivers, we can control. But the other three, we can't control from a balloon contact, vehicles, weather, you know, those are out of our control. So we try to do the best we can for the stuff we can control and keep being innovative in that space moving forward. I, I hope that addresses some of your questions in that area. Okay, yes, and I apologize. I think I think you were speaking to that just a few minutes ago and I had stepped out of the room briefly. So I, I think I maybe missed you explaining that the first time. Um, while I'm on the line, I think Marty brings up kind of a different uh, question as well, which is if we go back to selection of risks to be included in the ramp, um, my understanding is that you're supposed to look at your total risk register and uh, pick out those that have a safety component that puts it into, I think, the top, what, 40% of your, you have to rank all your risks from, from highest to lower, and then you choose that highest portion. So I'm expecting that this risk got into your ramp because it did meet that criteria uh, even though the, it does have a, it has a very, very, very small safety component, but because it has a safety component, it was sufficient to pass the criteria for, for making it into the ramp. Is that fair? Yes, Fred, that, that's a correct assessment. Um, I mentioned earlier that the wired down incident was, uh, the main driver for uh, this being a little higher in the safety component. So, yes, that is, that is a fair assessment to make. This is Marty Kurtovich. One thing I don't understand is you just showed us that uh, reliability is 87% of the risk score or of the core score, and yet this is the second highest risk. 
So I don't get the safety connection because reliability is almost 90% of the consequence score. Hey, Marty, so I, if I hey, hey, Marty, let me jump in here. This is Steve Hainer from, um, from the safety policy division. I think <clears throat> we're losing sight of the fact that we are, we should really be concentrating on the risk score. It is the risk score, which is the, the lower times the core that drives what goes into the RAM application, which is what Fred alluded to with the 40% ranking. So <clears throat> even though the core may be very low, but the risk score itself, which is the, the product of the lower and the core, is high because of the lower is high. So that's what drives its inclusion in the RAM application. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate that. But most in environmental risk assessments, it's both. It's the core and the lower. So that's why I'm emphasizing the core and do you have is that part of the settlement agreement where it says that lore is the most important part of the no of the not not so it's it's it says the risk score is what do i well i'm paraphrasing it of course it's the risk score that dictates what goes into the ram application the 40 percent is based on the safety component of the core times the lore and that's the first step that filters out what goes into the RAM. And I have not looked at all the risk scores, but I'm generally um, paraphrasing the concept that dictates what goes into the lore. And, and I'm sure some experts here, um, such as Tom Long, can chime in on whether or not this is the right concept. Hey, this, this is Elliot Henry from SoCal Gas. I, I just wanted to say, um, Marty, if it'd be helpful on, on some of these more general, um, so sort of the more general approach kind of questions and topics, we can, you know, we can, we can have a, a separate talk or a discussion or something, um, outside of this workshop, if that would be helpful on, on giving you the context, because these questions don't just apply to eat this, this chapter, they, they apply more broadly. And I think seeing how they apply more broadly might be, might be helpful. Thanks, Elliot. I actually think it's more of an internal discussion we need in safety policy because uh, you know I'm now learning of rules that were never discussed before in our division. So I appreciate the offer. Okay. Yeah. Just let us know. Uh, this is Chris. If I do have a question on this slide, if I if there's if this might be a time to ask it. Um, yeah. Go for it, Chris. So on on the dish, if we look just at distribution and and so yeah, I appreciate what um, what Marty was kind of like um, illuminating for me was that I, if I looked at this cell before you changed the decimal points, um, I saw a lot of zeros. So on distribution, I see core safety reliability. It was zero, and then I went on the spreadsheet that you sent out and I changed the decimal points. Um, and so then I can see a lot of the information, I guess, is kind of like hidden because when I look at the spreadsheet without changing the decimal points, I just see a bunch of zeros and it's kind of confusing to me trying to figure out, okay, what 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 is what are all the factors? But if I change it to 10 decimal points on each of these uh, D column ones, then it kind of gives me maybe some understanding about what those are. And I, so I did that on my, spreadsheet i don't know if we could do that quickly on on just the distribution for 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 like these eight or seven or eight items or at least the cores for this on uh, could we change do you mind changing those to 10 so i can ask questions about those those relative cores just 10 decimal points how about if we do this that you're saying so for like D9, could you make that? Yes, make it 100 is better. Okay. Yeah, D9 down through um, D12. Okay. So, um, 
So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's easier for me to kind of like see that they are different weightings. And I guess what I'm, but I, but my questions then have to do with, um, so core financial. So this is distribution. These cores are going to be factored in with the lore to develop the pre-mitigated risk score, if I understand it. Um, the total core is 4.3. Um, so is that then, is the total core, just so I make sure I'm kind of have the right framework here, is the total core going to be weighted by the one with the highest weighting, which be, would be core financial? Is that is that correct? That's That's slightly higher than stakeholder satisfaction? I think um, because we have MAVF and uh, the total core is calculated based on the input in the, the uh, MAVF framework. So. Okay, so they're yeah. all going to be weighted differently. Okay. Yes, that's right. So when I uh, try to calculate 88, 87%, uh, um, this is based on the MAVF. So if we calculate it that, way probably it's more like um representative so but this one is kind of you can think this is the natural industry for example the safety is the uh yeah near zero like <laughs> but the very small decimals in considering like big law number okay I, i'm just wondering if there would have been a way to have kind of captured how the core is contributing to sure. the core uh, safety is contributing to the total core with maybe another column or something. Because as as I look at the spreadsheet, you know that we receive, and I see a bunch of zeros and everything. I'm just kind of like I don't really I can't really understand the weightings and and how these are all contributing to the total core. And I don't know if another column could have could have illuminated that, but um, anyway. Um, yeah, I appreciate kind of like the, the exercise of adding decimal points and then kind of like understanding that because I'm it's kind of difficult to kind of come up oh, to speed on this. I I found something probably is good for you to um to to look at. Uh, if you go to the RIC summary, the RIC summary tab, there yes. is a column from H to column K, which is the the value after we did MAVF. So you can see the total law, uh, the total core is 5.62. So it'll come like uh, the summarize, like of the, the, the left of four columns, like from the safety through the stakeholder satisfaction. Okay, I'm pulling up that. I'm looking for that. Okay, I see that. I see where you're highlighting on my, on my yes. camera. If you click the L09, you can see the formula. So the formula is sum of the left four numbers. So it represents like the the numbers probably you like to see. So in the work, yeah, this is going what people try to show people what's the what's the real natural indice. And for these four columns, we try to give you like how we get to the core based on the MABF. Okay, and just to kind of give me a, a, a specific point that I can kind of understand better mm -hmm. on, on the previous, uh, on the risk scoring work paper tab, yes. for our distribution, there was a total core of 4.3 um, at the very top. Yes. Um, is that, going to show up on the RSE summary? Do you know what yes. cell that shows up? Yes, we can copy those like four columns data to exactly the same to the um, this paper. The, re the, the reason we did it this way in this tab, just to try to show people what's the natural indice look like. Because for example, uh, if we say one fatality equal like one safety indice and the serious injury is 0.25, but if you did like MAVF, one divided by sixty, uh, one divided by twenty times sixty percent, um, it's very hard to for people to understand what's the natural uh, consequence. For example, 
So that's the reason we did like both paper using the natural indices, but in the type of IC summary, we try to give people like more like um, not high level, but like the final, the call after we treated the MAVF. Thanks, Christine. So mm -hmm. with this 4.3 total core for distribution, does that number show up in the um, on the other tab, the RSE summary? Can you point me to where that is? That on the RSE summary somewhere? Can you point me to where uh, I would see can, it on the R? Can, can you see it again? You said a one six thirty two. Oh, which number you said? Okay, on above you have uh, um, D thirteen, where you have the total oh, course for distribution. Yeah. Sorry, in the summary tab, we use like the overall like the risk score. For example, you can see what's the number like the law. Uh, if you look at a column, column like G, which which is one six thirty two, match the the overall like section in the risk scoring work paper. So. Okay, but you don't you don't show where you get the four point three on this on this tab. Uh, I, I, Christine is uh -huh. when I look at the when I look at the five point six two, yes. the five point six two is the sum of of these yes. four values. Mm -hmm. When we look at this one, yeah, risk of scoring well, work paper. When we look at the right the risk scoring paper, we also have five. This is the same five point six two, okay. calculated a different way, and so I think again. Chris is asking if we have this 4.3 as a distinct value over here, okay. and I think the 4.3 is blended in, in the, within in the these total. numbers. Yes, in the total. The reason is it's um, because when we do like aggregate, we do the weighted average formula, but I can show you the formula later uh, if, um, how we can use the 4.32, uh, 4.30, and uh, the other one is substation. So. Uh, I can add the formula later if you um, if you want to do that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, actually, I would be I, if it were not too much, not too difficult later at some point. Maybe mm -hmm. after. I know there's a lot to be discussed today, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I would I would that would help me. So anyway, yeah, I'm happy to do it. Um, yeah, just do, give me a second. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, if if I could just try to try to help explain at a high level what what we're observing here, it's it's that the the risk scoring work paper that you have up on the screen now, Joe. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. No, you know, this one is dealing with this is this is natural units. Um, yeah. What the settlement refers to as natural units, um, they're not scaled and they're not weighted. Yeah. Um, so what. Um, Christine's referring to in the other, the, the RSC summary work paper, that's the, the scaled and weighted units yeah. that they've gone through. They're, the calculations aren't complicated, but there are some calculations that get you from yeah. natural units to scaled and weighted units. Mm -hmm. That's true. This is Marty Kurtovich. It would be helpful if the utility could provide a supplemental worksheet that showed the mm -hmm. percentages that each of the components provide to the overall score. Yes. So it's more clear. It. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mari, are you referring to Mari the the per, uh, weights associated with? Because I think that might be in the master input tab. No, what you guys just showed us that you know reliability is eighty seven percent. How that how you calculated that and the overall result, mm -hmm. the overall score, and then the percentage of the total. Okay. Understood. This is Tom from Turn. Could I ask a question about um, while we're if we could go to the RSE summary tab? Um, so I am curious about the column F, the percent change in lure, and the, just to explain why I'm asking about this. It's already been observed, I think Fred observed that um, most of the risk score is, most of what's responsible for the risk score here is the is the lure side, that there's a 
relatively high frequency of events and a relatively low consequence from those events. And that's what's contributing to a, what turns out to be a relatively high risk score. Um, so that means that the lower side is, is important. Um, and as I understand it, these mitigations are um, all affecting the lower side, not the core side. That's my first question. Is that right? Um, I have to double check, but I think mainly affect the law for sure. But that, well, um, this is I Marty Kurtovich. Fred has a uh, um, spoken to me, and he has expressed the same feelings, Tom. Right. So, I mean, because because if we look at this RSE summary page, it's only. It's it's trying to tell us how the RSE is calculated. It's only showing a percent change in lore. It's not showing a percent change in core. Um, you know, post post mitigated, but there's a difference between a pre mitigated core and a post mitigated lore. So that gets me leads me to conclude that the only thing that's supposed to be changing here is the lore. Can someone tell me if I'm right about that? Um, the purpose when we uh, do this um, work paper is like. Um, we try to um, put like as many as columns or information in this work paper, but the people can like um, you and the, the other expert can do like sensitivity analysis using different weight and the different the range. So that's the that's the purpose for this work paper. But when you look at our the other work paper, it's like RIC work paper. It represents more detail or additional information. Like if you look at the other work paper, you will find that the last row always the total risk reduction. And uh, how we get to this total risk reduction number, there are step by step and all the information uh, how we get it to this the final result. So if you look at this work paper, you can find the column M and sorry Nancy, um, the column N. Is the risk reduction number? Every mitigation has the risk reduction number. This number will uh, match the one in the other work paper. So this work paper probably represent like all the information we like to present uh, to the people. Also, we like to use this work paper for people to do the sensitivity analysis if you like to change the MABF. So um, yeah, hopefully I can explain it. And I also type the formula for uh, for for to answer the other question, like about like how we get to the 5.62 if we wanted to solve this problem right now. <laughs> well, um, Tom, I think to your question, I think you're asking to what extent is the risk reduction contributed towards a change in core and a change in lore and we'll follow up to make sure that is it all due to a change in lore or is there an aspect to a change in core in that yeah that is indeed my question because yes it, when it's time to go into um a little more detail about this rse summary worksheet um i got confused it seemed like it was showing maybe core impacts had an influence and i didn't quite get that So uh, is is this a good time to go with that, or did 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 we want to go back to the five point six two core value? And what, what's what's everyone's preference? I'm, I'm I think the it's topic a question. that you're talking that you're talking about, Tom. I mean, it, I'm looking at that spreadsheet, and so if I look at the risk reduction formula, it's it's a it's it's based upon F nine L L nine and G nine or F L and G, and so F F, so G and L are the, are the same for every entry on this uh, spreadsheet. So it must only be then, from what I can gather, only based upon the percent change in lore. It seems like the answer is in the spreadsheet. If I if that's what you were getting at. Well, Chris, thanks. I'm I, I've looked at that formula too. I I'm not sure. I, I I'd like to hear it from SDGE. <laughs> 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 
Yes, Catherine. we actually do the IC uh, risk reduction analysis. Um, like you will get the total risk reduction from each mitigation analysis. And when we talk about the percentage change in law, uh, it's like we divided by the total baseline risk score to get the percentage. And here we just uh, try to present to the people like um, all the information we would like to show and uh, also plug in some formulas so people can like move around the some sensitivity analysis. Um, so and hopefully I answer the question like uh, what you like. Well, Christine, but, uh, do, mm -hmm. Christine do, do you know when we initiate a mitigation and we evaluate mm -hmm. the we evaluate the effectiveness or the benefits of that evaluation? Are we considering the benefits only to be impacting the likelihood of the event, or are we also considering the the mitigation to impact the the consequence as well? I think there is some, but not. Uh, I, I remember it's very small amount, like for the consequence. For the consequence. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I think Tom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we will double check, but I think what we've said in the past is that for the vast majority, we are assuming the, a change in likelihood, a change in lore for the likelihood, but no change, no post mitigation change in core. I think that's consistent to what we've said in the past. Yes, because um, otherwise we have to add more. <laughs> okay, just, so wanted, uh, go ahead, Tom. Oh, just, to, just to summarize that, it sounds like you're saying Almost all of the RSCs are driven by a change. The, the, the RSC, that is the risk reduction over the cost, is driven by most of the risk reduction is driven by a change in lore, although there may be some mitigations that may have a very mm -hmm. minor uh, effect Correct. on the core. Correct. Um, all right. So, um, Christine, mm -hmm. since you raised it a moment ago, you actually anticipated a question. If you click on the cell for F9, which is the percent change in lore column, and um, the, um, sorry, I'm doing it on my, mm -hmm. um, you see the formula, it's, it's, um, <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, this is it's a, pretty, this a pretty daunting is. formula. Um, maybe you could try to help us understand what that yes, means. In, I'm glad in, to answer. Work. I know this is the question, like, um, probably like to explain the purpose of this work paper, because um, I was told like um, we will use this work paper for people to do sensitivity analysis. For example, if you change the MAVF tab, like any cell in the M uh, master input tab, like what's the range change, what's the weight change, how it look like, uh, I mean, the how, how the IC like change. So if that's the case, we cannot say this is fixed, right? Because if you type some uh, solid number, hard coded, it, it make no sense. For example, it all based on something like the natural uh, industry, like the change or the impact on the natural industry due to this mitigation. So this formula include all the information. Like for some mitigation, it's uh, it's like we have to add those value here. So if when you change the MAVF uh, inputs. You can see the real change, not just the, you know, like, um, we see how we describe it. Because if I hard coded the impact, for example, percentage change in law, if I hard coded, when you change the MAVF, it's not a true. For example, you have like reliability weight changed, but this score changes some safety, uh, natural industry, like, um, how we say that? The percentage is 0.2, for example, the uh, 20%, if we hard coded 20%. And you, later you said we want to change the um, something like uh, the weight, like for the safety from 0.6, uh, like 60%, we change it to like 80%. What's the IC? If we hard coded, you cannot see the real IC change. So we try to give you the real impact number based on the MAVF. So when you change the MAVF, the percentage also changed. Okay. Not I, 
Thank you. I, I do appreciate that they're not that you haven't hard coded and you know we we don't like to have plug just plug values. Mm -hmm. We like to understand where the numbers are coming from. So we appreciate yeah. that. So that's all good. Um, <laughs> what I'm trying to understand is um, let, me, let me try to ask a, a more focused question. Mm -hmm. um, if 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 only the lore is changing, and that's what I think is supposed to be. I would think is happening when it talks about percent change in lore. That's only the lore. Mm -hmm. Why, why is that? Why is why does the calculation of that have anything to do with the consequence side of the equation? It just seems to be it should just all be focused on the lure, and we're just trying to understand. It should be there's a reduction in the frequency of events that's determined, you know, I think on a different work paper, and that that reduction in frequency of events is applied to the frequency before. The mitigation and and so that reduced frequency should should then be yield the percentage change in lore. I this this equation here seems to me like kind of a non sequitur it, because it has it, it's it, it's weighting all the core values the you know the safety index weight the the safety index weight. I, I don't that doesn't make any sense. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Let me just let me Christine let me try to help. Okay. When when we put this spreadsheet initially together. As Christine mentioned, we put it together in a manner that would allow stakeholders to the extent they disagreed or they thought they wanted to have different ranges and weights as part of the MAVF. The way we put the spreadsheet together would be would enable someone who had the spreadsheet to change any one of these values, this value, discount factor, any one of these values, and see how it impacted the RSC. That was a deliverable that we wanted to provide. And in, in order to create that deliverable, this is how we created it. And, and so I, what I'm hearing is to the extent people are interested in using this spreadsheet for that purpose, good. But to the extent people are interested in using this spreadsheet, looking at these values for other purposes, it's creating a challenge. I, I, I really don't. I, I, I that you're repeating what Christine said. I get it. I tried to acknowledge that we appreciate that you're making these things live and usable and able to change. Again, I'll say that's good. But my question is, and let me please, please listen to my question. Yes. My question is, why should a percent change in core? Um, the, the derivation of that, which is what the formula is supposed mm -hmm. to be telling us how that how that percent for example, in, in F9, 0.69%. Okay. It's supposed to be um, showing how that number was calculated. Why should that calculation of that number be based, ha, have in any, be in, in any way based on um, the safety index, the safety, the reliability index, the stakeholder impact? This is supposed to be about the core, the, I'm sorry, the lower side. I don't understand why we're getting, why the, the derivation of this 0.69% yeah. has anything to do with core. I think you asked a very good question. Let me answer it. Because when we talk about the safety, reliability, and uh, financial and stakeholder satisfaction, yes, percentage, if we say we did reduce like 10%, we should apply for all 10% for everything. But actually, it's not like that. For example, when we do the overhead um, public safety, for safety, we have more effectiveness and something is like risk adjustment factor. Like this is like very big risk, like in this uh, like public area. So we know to say this effectiveness is like almost the same. We, we may like reduce more percent on the safety and uh, less percent on the reliability or you know, we didn't do any adjustment about the reliability reduction, but we talk about it's very high, like um, risk reduction, like uh, or weight on the safety part. So that's something like we can think the effectiveness or the weight or risk factor is different, even though you reduce 10%, but you may reduce more like on the safety, less, not less, like, almost uh, no adjustment on the reliability and the others. So I hope I can, I try my best to answer this question, but uh, 
um, if we really want to talk about what's the total risk reduction, we can look at additional uh, work paper or the second one. You can find out like how we get to the safety consequence reduction, how we get to the reliability reduction, and how we get to do this. So they are not equally weighted. So that's the reason why you see 10% is total risk reduction divided by the baseline risk score. Yes, this is something like um, the percentage is not like uh, same for every consequence. Um, let me just put, put out a hypothetical. Mm -hmm. um, and with very simple numbers, let's say the lore is 10. Mm -hmm. um, pre, this is pre-mitigation lore is 10. And the, and the pre-mitigation core is 1. Now that core value is based on a summation of, it, you know, of the of the of the um, scaled and weighted values for the attributes. Mm -hmm. um, but we're going to assume for this that it just it just adds up to one because that's a nice easy number to work with. Okay. So pre mitigation lore is ten, but pre mitigation core is one. So ten times one is the risk score. That's ten. So the, the pre-mitigation score is 10. Now we bring on the overhead public safety program. Mm -hmm. Comes to the rescue and it's gonna it's gonna mitigate a risk. It, it's gonna mitigate this risk we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And it's going to mitigate the lure because you said a moment ago that pretty much all these mitigations, they they go after the lure. They, do little, if anything, to affect the consequence. Let's let's just assume that this one mm -hmm. is one that really affects the lure, and let's have a nice round number. Um, let's assume. Well, here what we're trying to figure out is how do we how do we figure out how much this is going to affect the lure, right? Mm -hmm. And let's say let's let's say that your that this this thing says ten percent instead of zero point six nine percent. It's ten percent. Mm -hmm. So. What that would tell me is that it's reducing the number of the, this this one program is going to reduce the frequency mm -hmm. of the events we're concerned about by ten percent, and you don't take into account and, and so and so when we when when we, when we learn that this the the the, the um, percent reduction in lore is ten percent, that tells us that um, the new risk score is going to be 10 minus nine times the same one because the core hasn't changed for the core. So it's gone from 10 to nine, right? But notice that in that, that we didn't do anything with the core, the core stayed the same. And the only thing that led, led us to be able to figure out the percent change in lore was that there was some change in the percent in, in the number of of um, incidents or events that were occurring um, because of this mitigation. So again, it, it leads to the question: if, if if I'm right about that, why does the shouldn't shouldn't the, the genesis of this 0.69 percent just be something to do with a change in um, incidents? That is occurring by virtue of this mitigation, and and then the the the, it, the core, et cetera. That's just going to be a, something we multiply by after we get that after we get that number. It's just going to be something we multiply by. So it, it's it's being it's it it should be a constant here. It shouldn't have anything to do with how we get to the percent change in lure. Does that uh, does that make sense? Yeah, this is something like when we calculate the percentage change in law, we have denominator and denominator. And the denominator usually is like baseline score. It's aggregated the number, including the substation consequence and the distribution consequence and the, the, the plate and something. So when you look at the baseline score, it's actually like uh, aggregating the number. So the denominator is like, we talk about the, the total risk reduction. Um, when we reduce the risk, we sometimes reduce the more like on the safety side for this program and uh, the other one. So when you blend it together, it's very hard to say like 10% um, is like, uh, I have to, um, you know, check like 
those number actually exactly what it is, how we calculate it. But uh, this is something like we provide a fundamental um, the the result, like those decimals, like very long decimal data. It was the result of the the actual impact of this mitigation. But the formula, because it's very complicated the formula, including the substation and something, so it's aggregated. So that's the reason we want to give you like, uh, more like overall looking like how we get it to the percentage. Otherwise, we can just do like what you said, hard coded, and uh, that's it. The reason is like, yes, we have some consequence like reduction uh, or the risk of reduction number, but from the safety, from the reliability, from the the other like two attributes, but uh, when we Add it together, aggregated because we have the other um, like substation and something like in the baseline risk score. We try to aggregate it in the right way. Otherwise, if we hard coded and uh, aggregated, it's it's something like it, it will be the different number. I have to say. Well, could we get at this a different way? Um, mm -hmm. could we, um, I wonder, Joe, could you bring up the RSC work, the final 2021 RSC work paper, and let's look at the tab that is specifically um, for this overhead public safety mitigation C1. And maybe somebody could talk through how, you know, there's a lot here, but if, if you, sure. I, I don't want to ask my questions, leading questions. If, if someone can just sort of explain, I assume this is telling that some, somehow, in, somewhere in here, we're, we're going to be, it's going to explain how the mm -hmm. change in lore was calculated. Uh, so if someone could, could walk us through this, that would be great. Yes. So you can see the last row is the total risk reduction. We can do the backtrack, like, this is the formula based on the MAVF. So we have each consequence like risk reduction, each attribute risk reduction. From the safety index impact, we have um, what's the uh, C C twenty six? Yeah, C twenty six. So T C twenty six. How we get to the C twenty six? It's including all the information like what's our small wire risk, what's the wire down risk. What's the overhead public safety uh, risk um, uh, factor, for example, and what's the effectiveness? It's like if you can, uh, I know it's very long, like um, the list of the inputs, but uh, the methodology behind is like we try to find out the, what's the safety risk in the overhead public area, especially for like school uh, uh, the, the highway and uh, so we found like how many for example how many miles currently and uh, what's the what's the portion of the risks uh, for these miles and if we replace uh, yeah if we replace those wires uh, what's the percentage risk reduction especially for the safety we have um, like risk of factor, if I remember correctly, because it's like more risk or risky like than the other areas if we have a wild down risk. So, um, Christine, um, mm -hmm. I think I think what we're seeing here is something we haven't seen yet. Um, mm -hmm. And it, maybe um, that's what's throwing us throwing at least me off a little bit, which is in, in fact, I think what you're saying is, even though it's not captured on the previous um, work paper we were looking at, the, the RSE summary work paper, this one is showing that, in fact, there are not just impacts of this mitigation on the lower side, but there are also impacts on the core side. Is that is that what this is showing?
Um, in this analysis, we assume the overhead public safety risk is even risky than the other wire down risk. So even though we reduce the likelihood by 10%, maybe it's not the same in the other areas in the territory. So I have to say we reduce the risk events, but uh, like in the risky areas. Well, um, uh, is your question, could we have included a change of core within the change of lore value? Yeah, I think that they're being, they're being combined. And I think, I think maybe there was, there was, because I think when you go to this, this thing, it, you know, so I'll look at, for example, line row 41, stakeholder satisfaction index reduced. That's one of the attributes for core. Apparently that's being reduced by this mitigation or if we go to row 35, financial cost reduced, that's another one of the attributes. Apparently that's being somehow affected by this mitigation. Um, or um, safety yeah. index impact, row 26, apparent impact I assume means the effect of the mitigation is having the mm -hmm. effect of somehow reducing the safety impact. Um, yeah. is, am, am I understanding this by right? Yeah, it's all driven like by we change or replaced the the overhead public, uh, you know, wires in that area. So that's the reason I said the nominator is like um, um, <laughs> it's very complicated. So we use the total risk reduction instead of just the percentage change in law because we think for each attribute there is not a single formula like we can say. For example, the stakeholder satisfaction. We have this attribute, but we not treat everything the same. For example, for overhead public safety and the stakeholder satisfaction uh, value is different from the other stakeholder satisfaction indices in, in other areas. Well, and it would be helpful if, if we could just, if I, if we could just acknowledge I don't think it's a necessarily a big problem. I just think if I could get a straightforward answer that yes, this happens to be a mitigation. This happens to be a a um, mitigation that has that where SDGE is modeling an impact on the consequence side as well as the likelihood side. Am I, yeah, it, I, I clearly I what's I, going on here? And, and, but I don't. I don't. I'm not hearing a yes. That's right. Or. But we actually replace the wire. So just because we replace the wire, um, can we say just to replace, uh, change the law only? But uh, we actually, if you look at our risk scoring work paper, there are the um, there are one section called there is a section called let me see stakeholder satisfaction. You will see our inputs for distribution incident there are stakeholder satisfaction, like very small stakeholder satisfaction index. And the other one for the safety related uh, incident, we have a very high total like set, uh, satisfaction index. So when you look at the formula in this tab, we actually is like weighted average number. So to answer your question, I really like to say if it is yes or no question, but uh, I believe we reduced my, uh, we replaced miles. Actually, we reduced the likelihood of event. But uh, based on our complicated, um, you know, the inputs, we treat like not like every single uh, incident the same. For example, the other distribution incident, they have a something like a uh, very small stakeholder satisfaction, like 0. 0.0002. But for the safety related stakeholder satisfaction, which is like very high number, like 38. So even though we replace the wire, we have something like a weighted average consequence. Um, I don't know if I, I, I tried my best, but uh, 
Hey, hey, huh? hey, Tom, this, this is Christian. Tom, I'll, I'll try to chime in here. I, I think the answer is yes to your question, but I think as you hear from Christine, we're going to go back and just double check the work papers. And if we can make some modifications or changes, we'll, we'll, we'll communicate that ahead. But yeah, I, I believe the answer is yes, but we'll just double check that internally and follow up with you on that topic. Okay, thank you. I'm just dying to, to jump in just to see if I have interpreted things. What I think is going on is right here in this work paper, you're coming up with a total risk reduction of the risk score. You've included some consequence uh, effects in that total risk reduction. We're taking that number 63.36 as our total risk reduction. We're bringing it back to the other work paper that we were looking at. And you're representing that risk reduction as if it was a change in lore. I think for ease of understanding, or maybe that's what you believe, it, it, it makes it easier if you just put all of that risk reduction. You say, what is the percentage that that risk reduction is of my total risk score? And I think that's, you know, 63 divided by 9,000 is going to be that small percentage number you showed as the percent lower reduction. Uh, but you're basically, whether it was a, you know, there's consequence or likelihood change, I think you're representing everything as if it was a, a lore, a likelihood change. And at the end of the day, when you're calculating your risk spin efficiency, that formula doesn't really care how you got the risk reduction. It doesn't care whether your risk reduction was in likelihood or in consequence. You're just feeding it what my risk reduction is. So I, I think that's a lot of what's happening. Um, and, and stop me right there if, if that is so far correct. Fred, as Christian mentioned, I think that does that could be the approach we took. We just need to double check. All right, sorry for taking the time. You guys are gonna check on that anyway. I did want to, while we have a little lull, uh, I know we've been focusing on the EII. Uh, the cyber team is on standby. Should, again, just, uh, we can continue and, and I'm going to make a statement. I don't know of the availability of the of the cyber team to talk uh, to make themselves available on the 14th, um, where we had a two hour window on the 14th, the first hour to talk about uh, SoCal gases integrity management, and the second hour to be determined with carryovers. Uh, to, uh, trying to be fair to everyone, uh, maybe just if we could have a quick discussion. If folks would like to continue discussing EII. Or if they think there's value to uh, transition over to the cyber team, or if we should just you know, reschedule the cyber discussion to another time. And so we can let the cyber, because it's a totally different cyber team that's, if you will, waiting on hold. Um, my thoughts are that um, I don't think I, I have more questions um, about EII and how these numbers were calculated. I mean, it, questions surfaced during this, and we'll, we'd like to hear your follow up. But I'm not sure it's worth going through it this anymore from from my perspective. Um, so speaking for turn, we'd be ready to segue to to cybersecurity and um, be fine with with um, you know the Semper folks taking 20 minutes to give us an overview and then we could see if, if that's good enough for everybody or whether we need more. I don't I don't, I don't intend to ask a lot of questions about cybersecurity. I'm not prepared to ask a lot, and I know there are confidentiality issues, so it doesn't make it particularly easy to do that anyway. So, I'm I'd be fine with hearing a 20 minute presentation, and and um, maybe that might be enough. Okay, really appreciate that, Tom. Others? Welcome. I see we are uh, fine with me. To audio. Okay. And I this am is going Chris. For joining us. Uh, I I I'm, I think it makes sense too. I heard some other audio going on. I wasn't sure what was going on, but um, if if we could, I'm happy if we moved on to cyber as well. If I could ask one quick question though on the RSC summary, 
um, because maybe it will be an answer that comes back later. I'm not sure. But on the RSC summary sheet. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so I was just curious. I think this this same kind of question came up on a different earlier workshop, but the core, the pre-mitigated lore, all of the all of the cores, all of the pre-mitigated lores are the same for every one of these IDs. And I was just curious um, if if Sembra could explain why they are the same or why they are not different for each one of these. Um, items. Christine, are you able to give some thoughts on that one? It is a basically score, but when we do each individual um, like mitigation, we do very like uh, hard working to do the analysis to try to get the accurate risk score, but in the what paper here, we actually based on the baseline risk score. Yeah, it was like aggregated one. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah Chris, Chris, I think consistent with what we've said in the other work papers, we are treating, I think, all the different mitigations relative to the, uh, if, I think they use the word system level risk. And so that's why we're, we have the same pre-mitigation lore for all the mitigations, because we're treating them all at the, um, I think what the system level, uh, what I think is the answer we gave in the other workshops. You're on mute. Sorry about that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, okay. Thank you. Um, I, we, we may want to follow up on that at some point, because I hear that that's what you're doing. I'm, I'm just not. It's not clear to me why that is is the method that you're following, but um, but that might be something we can follow up at maybe one of the later workshops. So okay, thank you. I don't I don't want to take away time from the cyber stuff. Um, so oh, all right, great. I'm going to stop sharing, and uh, the cyber team's going to step in. They're going to share. And again, Tom, I think I pre I appreciate you mentioning uh, we did have some some concerns about. But certainly confidentiality, the data. And so we put together a presentation uh, to try to proactively anticipate questions and answer them proactively without um, you know, putting ourselves in a bind of trying to figure out what is or isn't confidential. So uh, we have uh, Gavin, I think, are you gonna take the lead? Yes, I am, Joe, thank you. Okay, great, thank you so much. And I think Lisa's sharing here. There we go. Let's give her a second to get the presentation up. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is, is Gavin Warden, and joining me today are uh, Lance Mueller, Robert Prince, Dan Thompson, Chris Baker, and Sharon Cohen to support the Cybersecurity Ramp workshop discussion today. Lisa, if we can go to the next slide, please. So for context, wanted to start off with this introduction and, and disclaimer information. And it's really mostly what Joe just covered, but uh, just, just so that we're all on the same page. Uh, if an adversary were to obtain cybersecurity confidential information, it would disclose information about the company's security practices and potential areas of vulnerability. Cybersecurity data is considered proprietary, so it's not currently published, and if made publicly available, could potentially present a risk to public and consumer safety, result in financial loss, as well as potentially uh, harm to the companies and their customers. Disclosure of such information may permit an adversary to bypass or exploit the utilities processes or gain insight and knowledge to gauge the most effective type of attack. And in the case of ransomware, potentially how much money to demand. And then lastly, for these reasons, confidential and proprietary information about the company systems and processes will not be disclosed during today's workshop. Next slide, please, Lisa. Thank you very much. Just a high level overview of the, uh, the cyber program. So cybersecurity is a shared service for sdg &E and SoCal Gas, as well as at Semper Corporate Center. The cybersecurity risks are managed across the enterprise by our cybersecurity program. Um, cybersecurity is the only ramp chapter submitted jointly between SoCal Gas and sdg &E. 
and our risk spend efficiencies were calculated for each of the company's controls at SoCal Gas and stg &E. Next slide, please, Lisa. So a little more foundational context um, from a cyber threat perspective, cybersecurity is a unique risk as compared to other risks because it deals with intelligent adversaries who are attempting to achieve their objectives by gaining access to company systems or information through artifice or other improper means. And the cybersecurity threat continues to evolve rapidly. So the company's strategy to counter cybersecurity threats must be flexible and enable um, adaptation to these evolving threats over time. And over on the right, it's, it's not an exhaustive list. It's just some, some, some examples of some of the key areas, right? So types of things that, that malicious actors might target uh, include things like control systems, right? Both for the electric and gas system, physical infrastructure that has some sort of computer dimension to it, reg regulator stations, compressor stations, pipelines, et cetera, uh, communication systems to include voice and data, and also company personnel, right? Because if you can social engineer people to give you information, and then that can facilitate uh, other types of attacks as well. Um, typical kinds of attacks or, you know, um, more common examples include denial of service, ransomware, social engineering, which is what I was just referring to, sabotage, disruption of communications, and exploitation of vulnerabilities. And then some examples of the types of groups that do these types of activities include nation states, terrorists, hacktivists, criminal cyber actors, and insiders to include you know, employees and or contractors. Next slide, please, Lisa. So our approach, from a ramp perspective to managing these risks was to develop five different programs. And you'll see them, they're actually listed both on the, on the left and the right. I'm just gonna do a really quick overview of each of these for context. And the idea is each of these programs is a collection of controls in a particular area that I'll describe to help reduce and manage cyber risk. So the first one we call perimeter defenses. This is basically technologies that help control access uh, to company information, systems, applications, et cetera, from our systems to some, some type of system we don't own, whether that be the internet or some, some third party. So it's that kind of that demark between the company systems and other kinds of systems. And that helps us with, with attack prevention and, and detection of malicious activity and, and various other types of things as well. We also have uh, a program around internal defenses. So this helps us understand, uh, it helps us to both prevent and potentially detect malicious activity that might be happening if somebody's able to evade perimeter defenses and get into, into systems. Uh, and that includes both in the uh, IT and, and OT systems. We have sensitive data protection program, which is even a, a more focused version of the, of the internal defenses, excuse me. and. Uh, and that's around understanding where our most sensitive data is and what's going on with that, with that sensitive data so we can do a better job of protecting it. And then the last two are around uh, information technology systems and operational technology systems. So I wanna spend a little more time talking about the difference between those. In general, you know, the IT systems are things that people may be more familiar with. These are the, the business technologies that many of us use, the laptops that we're using today and, you know, the key applications that we use to, to, to use those spreadsheets that we, you know, we talked about the um, risk quantit quantitative analysis about all of those kinds of things. All of those are more typical IT systems. Uh, and so we've got, a, you know, a series of, uh, or a program around making sure that IT systems are protected from, from obsolescence because over time, IT systems uh, go out of support and then we don't get patches and new types of vulnerabilities can be discovered. So th this, it, that whole, programs around making sure that we maintain the life cycle of key IT systems to, to help avoid or reduce cyber risk. And then operational technology are the, the technologies used around the core business functions that we have, around the, the delivery of, of reliable and safe energy. And, and so there's a whole number of, of specialized technologies associated with that that may have some similarities with IT, but also some significant differences. So we make sure that we have a focused program just around operational technology cybersecurity so that we make sure uh, that we're, we're uh, dealing with the appropriate risks and, and controls that are specific to those operational technologies. I'll pause there to see if, uh, if anybody has any 
questions. Oh, well, maybe I'll just cover one last thing really fast. On the right hand side are, are again, those, those five different programs and some examples at a high level of the types of, of controls associated with those, you know, so for, for example, in perimeter defenses, things like firewalls and web application firewalls and denial, distributed denial of service defenses. And then in internal defenses, things like endpoint security and insider threat detection and data loss prevention. And then sensitive data uh, protection, things like identity and access management, uh, more stringent data loss prevention, forensics. Um, I just talked about OT, so specific tools around OT, uh, operational technology networks, like um, operational technology specific network anomaly detection. And then lastly, I, I covered. We're losing audio. Did you lose my audio? Am I, yep. am I back? Yes. I'm about sorry. What, to... About 30 seconds. All right. So I, the last 30 seconds, I think what I covered was the right hand side of the of the uh, of the programs and just saying that in each one of those programs are some examples listed of the types of controls. You got uh, halfway through. Yeah. OK. OK. Sorry about that. All right, so any, any questions on anything I've, I've covered so far? Gavin, I just have a quick question. This is Chris Parks with Cal Advocates. So yes. I can only imagine that with coronavirus and a lot of folks working remotely, <laughs> uh, that, uh, um, that there's a lot of folks using um, their own computer systems. Where would that fall into in terms of your defensive um, programs? You know, taking care of that aspect of things. It's a great question, and there's really a number of different controls that that we look at managing the risks around. Um, remote, it boils down to remote access, right? Employees from working remotely, and so that includes things like perimeter defenses and internal defenses. And uh, we we pay close attention to these kinds of threats as they evolve, right? And un, kind of understanding what the dimensions of them are and what kinds of things that we can do to further improve security. So. What sorts of things can we do to make sure that our virtual private network remote access technologies are properly configured and well monitored, well maintained? What sorts of things do we do need to do to to uh, to teach our employees how to be, you know, have improved cyber cyber safety practices at home, right? So think think more closely about how they're protecting company information when they're working from home, things like that. So there's a there's we try to look at all of those different dimensions and then further um, modify our, our controls accordingly to, to manage those risks. Hopefully that answered your, your question, Chris. Yeah, that's very helpful. So it sounds like perimeter defenses, internal defenses, remote access. And I imagine a lot of folks are using personal communication devices and, and uh, or maybe they're using company equipment, but I guess that would all follow under, under those programs. Thank you. I was just curious. Yep, Thank you. yep no problem. Great question. Yeah, hi, uh, as a follow-up, I, I was just trying to imagine, I would expect that your, um, your employees that are directly working in like a SCADA control room environment probably aren't trying to remote dial into their SCADA system from home. They are present, I would expect, at the control center and they're not going to be vulnerable to, you know, use of their own at-home computer devices. Great question. I'm not going to get into the details here, but I can assure you that we have well-defined controls around how people access our critical operational technology uh, environments so as to manage those exact risks that you're highlighting now. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions on this slide before we move on? All right, Lisa, can we move to the next slide, please? So when we, uh, again, uh, from the ramp process perspective, thank you. Uh, when we looked from an alternatives analysis perspective, we looked at those five different programs and the different controls in each of them. And we assess those controls with respect to their impact reducing risk. Does it have a high impact reducing risk, medium impact or low impact reducing risk? And then we looked at different combinations of those to, to understand what's the best combination of, of those controls from a high, medium, and low impact perspective in those different programs, uh, both from a you know, risk 
reduction perspective and, and ultimately efficiency perspective from a from an RSC point of view. So the the program portfolio that we went forward with is the is listed here as the 2021 control. So that's comprised of medium and high impact uh, controls. They're cost effective and contain the highest RSEs. We looked at two other combinations of portfolios as well. So our alternative one port portfolio comprised only the high impact risk reduction uh, controls. And that had the lowest cost, but the least risk reduction, lower RSE, but didn't quite reduce risk to the, ex to the uh, extent that we're comfortable with. And then the second alternative portfolio that we examined was all cybersecurity controls in all of those different programs. But this had the highest cost, although it had the most risk reduction, right? But the incremental benefit was, was less relative to cost. So that's why we, we went back to, as I said, that, that top group in there, medium and high impact projects. Uh, questions on, on alternative analysis before I turn the mic over to Chris to talk about our quantitative analysis approach. All right, great. Here are no questions. I am going to introduce Chris Baker, who will walk us through an example uh, on our quantitative approach. Great. Thank you, Gavin. Hello, everyone. My name is Christopher Baker. I'm an enterprise risk manager for um, SoCal Gas, and uh, Jeff Bunting, as well as myself today, will be supporting the uh, quantitative review. So uh, before we dive into the work papers, um, I know we've spent a little bit of time on the uh, other example for RSC summaries, but I would just like to provide a quick summary of how we uh, calculated an RSC um, using this publicly available data for cybersecurity. So your first step is you wanna be able to determine your core. And when I say core, that's really the consequence of risk event. And that includes your safety, financial reliability, and your, uh, your customer set, or your uh, satisfaction. And based upon those uh, percentage allocations in your framework, that's gonna give you your overall uh, core value. So your next step is to determine the percentage change in war. And when I say that, I'm really wanting to know with your mitigations, how much are we reducing the likelihood of an incident from occurring using those mitigations? Your next step is to determine your risk reduction value. And um, within your, uh, risk reduction value, you're gonna just do some simple multiplication. You're gonna be taking your percentage change in core times your, uh, your pre-lore and multiplying it by your core to get your risk reduction. Now, finally, you've arrived to your, your RSC. And that's also a simple uh, multiplication as well, where you're gonna be multiplying your um, discounted time uh, times your risk reduction and then you're gonna divide that by your, um, your cost and then multiply it by a thousand for a readability factor to determine your, um, your RSC. So that, that's just in the layman's terms of how we get through to the RSC value shown here. Any questions? No? Okay. No questions? Okay, perfect. Well then at this point, um, I'd like to open it up to everyone for questions on the, the quantitative section for cybersecurity. But keep in mind that a lot of this data is confidential, so we are gonna be limited as to what we can answer. Well, this is this is Tom from Turn. I, I guess I am interested to know, it, it looks that from this example um, as if, um, as we were looking at the previously, the, well, let me just ask directly the question. Sure. Is the, is the impact of the mitigation, these mitigations to reduce the likelihood or does it also sometimes affect the consequence side as well? It can, depending on the control, it could, it could be either or both. Okay. All right. So this, 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 this may be an example of a risk where the um, impacts of the mitigations are on both sides of the the risk equation. Okay, that's helpful. Um, then the, um, I guess, how much can you tell me about what's counted as a as a risk event? What is, what are the incidents that are being counted? I could say that we do have some events that are included um, in our quantification of for cybersecurity incidences. There's there's three sub events that we're looking at. Three sub events. Um, 
Yes. Are you, are you able to describe them or? Yes, they, they are included in the quant work papers and they include a call center outage, a SCADA uh, incident, as well as a, a electrical blackout. And are those, are there, is that the, all of the incidents that are covered by this risk or are there others that are, you're not able to talk about? We're not able to talk about. Those are the, those are the three that have been disclosed in the work paper. I see. I'll, um, I'll stop asking questions there and let anybody else ask questions. Hey, Chris, thanks so much. This is Joe. Uh, again, just want to make sure that we give everyone an opportunity to ask questions. Again, we recognize, uh, we appreciate your understand with regards to the, the confidentiality nature of this topic, but uh, we do want to make sure that if people do have questions, they do have an opportunity to, to ask. Yeah, hey, can you hear me okay? This is Jeremy Bowdis with SPD. I can, yes. Yeah, hey, I'm the uh, assigned lead uh, reviewer for this uh, subchapter, this cross-cutting um, portion of the ramp. Could you just spend a minute or two um, walking us through your preferred alternative and what that's going to consist of? And when you show slides, um, you got four tables on this roughly eight and a half by 14. Um, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm getting into old age, but I really can't see this unless I maybe press my nose to the screen. It's just, it's really challenging to try to view this. And after two hours, um, you know, we need all the help we can get just to sort of stay engaged. I so, would Lisa, advise I just, going forward that you put less on one page and like just provide a uh, a higher level of resolution on what's before us. It's just a lot on the single page at a time. So if you can, as you speak to things, zoom in to make it easier for us to see what it is you're speaking to, that would be helpful. Thank you. Jeremy, just just one comment as well. Uh, cybersecurity, it, it's not a cross-functional risk. It's an actual assigned ramp risk for both companies as well. Uh, correct. I'm I'm thinking of uh, physical security, which I'm also reviewing. Perfect. Thank you. If there's a particular area that you'd like to see, we could zoom in to. Uh, I, I apologize for the uh, for the low resolution for these tables. Yeah. Um, well, you kind of went over really close, really quickly. Your uh, your various alternatives, um, but maybe you could back up a little bit and just talk about the preferred alternative or the proposed plan itself. Sure, Gavin, did you want to jump on that one? Yeah, so so Jeremy, um, the way we've got that set up is in those five different programs, we identified, like I said, the medium and the high risk or medium and high risk reduction controls or mitigations. And uh, I, I can tell you that in this in this public Context. I don't want to go into more detail than that, but it's it's the types of examples of things. If we go back a couple more slides, um, at a higher right. level. So I, I, yeah. I guess um, for folks who haven't really dug in, and maybe for folks who haven't read this chapter in a while, basically what we're getting is that you sort of have a baseline, and that's what's existing. That's everything that's currently required, either electively or by fiat by some kind of um, either state or federal uh, regulation. So that's your controls. And then you, you're you looking at other things that go above and beyond that, and that'd be your mitigations. And you sort of are looking at one set of tiers, which are, um, I guess, more bang for buck. They sort of are things that um, get you further with less cost. And then you've got the the other approach, which is a litany of projects, which would really get you above and beyond that, but then you start to get into some cost effectiveness issues. So, I mean, can you tell us you're, you're not going to do both. Are you going to do something in the middle? Are you going to do the, the lower, more bang for the buck thing? Are you going to do the more expansive thing? Um, 
I mean, can you sort of talk about these sorts of things and like how they're different? Absolutely. Yeah. So our selected portfolio is the combination of the high high risk reduction and medium risk reduction options that we've got. And that was our that to your using your language, right? That was the best bang for the buck situation uh, there. So that's what we're doing. And we're so we're not going to do just the highs and we're not going to do everything. It's 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 focusing in on on the uh, the highs and the mediums. Now, my caveat to that is, as I've mentioned earlier, it's a rapidly evolving threat, right? So there may be, you know, we need to be flexible and we may make some changes as we go based on the evolving threat environment. But that's that's essentially uh, our approach from a ramp perspective. Can you tell us anything more? Uh, I can again. These are the these are the on this screen here are the examples of the kinds of controls and mitigations that we have in those different uh, programs. But I'm not comfortable going into much more detail in a, in a public setting on this. So do you have a page that? I guess this is this is your actual what we call preferred alternative or proposed plan. Then this is what you are electing to do, and it sounds like it's sort of a a middle ground approach with some of the lower cost and some of the more sort of expansive. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> rather than framing it in terms of cost, it's it's the it's the highest risk reduction impact and the medium risk reduction impact, which gives us the best cost efficiency with respect to risk reduction using this quantitative approach. Right, and from what I recall in my review of this, which was some weeks ago, um, it sounds like you're pretty much just on this sort of steady course of doing what you've done in the past, nothing really super novel or really doing anything different. It's just sort of keeping your software up to date, having the experts there, having enough people, just simple kind of common sense precautionary things to make sure that systems are updated, software's updated, uh, passwords are updated, people are trained, Jeremy, you've got is, the experts there Jeremy, tracking this the is data. Joe. Jeremy, this is Joe, and I, and I apologize for interrupting. But we do want to be cautious. The information that would have been sent to you guys as the commission was the unredact unredacted data. And we do want to be cautious that to the extent you may reference something that you saw that was redacted in other people's versions of data. That is a concern we have. Yeah, I, I think basically what I'm speaking off of is the public submitted application, as it were. So your your GRC your your ramp chapter in your application. Yeah, and Jeremy, I hear what you're saying. I do want to correct a couple of things. Um, I, we're we're definitely not just doing the status quo by any means. Uh, this is a, a very innovative cybersecurity program, and and this 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 team is very focused on staying on top of the evolving risk. So that means we're regularly evaluating and regularly changing our our approach to managing cyber risk. And I think in some of the things we're doing are are quite leading edge. Uh, it, it, quite frankly, I'm very, very proud of this program. Uh, but, um, but again, we're, we're also trying to do it in, in a cost efficient manner, right? And that's what we're trying to, to explain here. Hopefully that helps. Okay. Oh, you know, 1 thing I didn't, I didn't, um, explain to you in, um, related to what you're saying is. So, you know, our assessment of the situation is, and especially working with, with, um, outside research as well. Is that the cyber risk continues to increase year over year. So what we're trying to do is invest in continuing to improve our cybersecurity controls so that at the very least we're keeping pace with the risk if if not um, improving on our risk reduction year over year. Right. And um, I'm being careful not to disclose anything that's not already um, out there publicly, but um, I Let's turn real quick, if I could, just to your physical security cross-cutting risk, because it does say that that informs the cyber risk. And I'm wondering, is there some way that you can tell us in general terms without revealing anything sensitive, how an example of how a physical security threat could impact the cybersecurity risk? Great question. So physical security is a core component of cybersecurity. In other words, if you can't physically protect your cyber assets, and a bad guy can get their hands on it, then they can have an impact. So it's critical 
that cybersecurity and physical security are working together, that's what ultimately provides uh, best practice cybersecurity, right? So if we've got critical cyber assets, we need to make, we, we partner with the, cyber, with the physical security team to make sure that all of the right physical security controls are there to protect them as well, including uh, prevention and detection and response and all of the things that go with that in the physical domain. Okay, so I guess the most, I guess, clear hypothetical example would be a bad guy gets into your system with some kind of a flash drive or camera and starts stealing data. Sure, or okay. or if a bad guy can get their hands on any piece of computer equipment that's critical, they could you know manipulate something or add something or intercept something. So we definitely want to reduce uh, you know physical access as well. Did that answer your question? And so the, the, the reality is, is we have a very close partnership between the physical security team and the cybersecurity team in this company for that for those reasons. Okay. And does would you say it's fair to say that cyber also feeds into physical security? The two are interreliant? Absolutely, because now physical security is more and more using technology, right? That has computer and cyber dimensions to them. So the cyber team helps the physical team adequately protect. They're physical security tools that have a cyber dimension to them. So it works both ways. Okay. And then I guess, I guess the last question is, um, how can we be sure that treating cyber as a primary risk approach is really the way to go? I ask this because, you know, physical security is treated as a cross -cut, cross cutting risk. It wasn't always treated as a cross-cutting risk by Semper. I think in its last ramp, it treated it as a primary risk. And then I, I, I suppose you all decided there was a better way to do it. How do we know we're doing the right approach with cybersecurity and that it's a primary risk? And who's to say the physical security, that's not the primary risk and cyber is the, the cross-cutting. I mean, how do you know which one is the, the core risk and which one's the, the feeder risk? I appreciate that question. Uh, I'm, I'm not able to speak to the, to the physical risk because that's not my domain, but I can tell you that from a cybersecurity perspective, it, it's, it's a critical capability with respect to, to safety and reliability, right? So if, uh, if, if a malicious actor were able to, to compromise systems, they could have an impact on our safety systems. They could have an impact on our energy systems. They could have an impact on the systems that, that help us achieve reliability. So cyber is cyber's critical that way from, from a ramp perspective in ensuring safety and reliability. So um, I guess at the end of the day, there's a bigger threat coming from cyber. There's more, there's more risk, more resources toward that because it's a bigger threat. What, yeah, one way you could look at it is because of the logical dimension of cyber, people can reach out and interact with systems from all over the globe in many cases. Whereas with physical, you have to have boots on the ground and it can be a little more challenging. So there's just, there's more of a threat surface in many ways uh, from a cyber perspective. Okay, thank you for this uh, further perspective. No problem, anytime. Hey, hey, Jeremy, I, I will add to the extent you are interested in having follow-up discussions on some of the data that is confidential, certainly reach out to us and, and we can arrange those phone calls. Anything else from anyone? If not, Trying to see if there's any um, hands raised or anything like that. If not, uh, I definitely appreciate everyone's discussion today, EII and cyber. Uh, Tom, to your uh, points at the end of EII, we've jotted down some follow-up questions. Uh, we will definitely be getting back to you. And to the extent, and certainly other stakeholders were hearing those questions as well, we'll make sure everyone is aware of those follow-ups. Um, and so if there are no additional questions, again, just a reminder that Next week, Tuesday the 14th, we have scheduled our fifth of the five workshops uh, with the primary topic being a discussion of the so 
Cal Gas Integrity Management Program. Uh, and then to the uh, and so that's what we have identified so far for that workshop. If there's no other questions or comments, certainly appreciate everyone's time and um, attentiveness. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe and everyone. Thank you.